Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Christian Harloff. What's up, guys? Welcome to the greatest movie news show on the internet. It is Movie Talk, and I'm excited. we got a lot of great stuff to talk about today. Great. Also here, John Schnepp. Hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, was, <clears throat> I had a lot of drinks last night. <laughs> Uh, the complex guys are in town, so it's <laughs> always dangerous. <clears throat> How's it going? Also here, Mark Ellis. What an amateur, man. You go, you get hammered on a Tuesday. That's what I did last night. But you got to be up bright and early, ready to talk movies, right? Right. Yes. Right. Right. Let's we're do talking it. Are we going to talk right. some trailers off the top? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, we, it's we, on top. Oh, uh, it's right. on top. Right here. Okay. <laughs> Sony Pictures has released the very first trailer for The Magnificent Seven online. The updated Western, based on Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, is about a group of desperate townspeople who employ the production from Seven Outlaws stars Denzel Washington, Chris Pratt, Ethan Hawke, and Vincent D'Onofrio. The movie is directed by Antoine Fuqua and comes to theaters September 23rd. Christian, what do you think? of the trailer for Magnificent Seven. I loved it, man. And I loved the pictures yesterday and the, and this trailer followed it up. Had a, um, obviously, you, you felt a bit of the old film in there, but you also uh, remind me of Tombstone a little bit. Yeah. And haven't really had a real fun Western in, in a while. And, and I like this cast and D'Onofrio just, I think you said it yesterday. It's like they, kind of like an old rancher they just found. Yeah. Like they, they, there's everything about this trailer <laughs> and how Fuqua and, and Denzel have been working together so well <laughs> lately. This is another one I want to see Fuqua kind of throw his hat in the ring for totally. um, for a western and this is just it's since they announced the remake and they announced the cast and then the picture I've loved everything that I've seen so far and I'm adding the trailer to that mix Mark I'm pretty sure all seven of those dudes went out drinking with Schnapp last night Probably. Like, <laughs> none of them look yeah. particularly well dressed but that's what you want out of Magnificent Seven well man. it is 420 I love this trailer it is 420 today that means mm -hmm. nothing to me I'm more of a booze guy but uh, yeah I, I think Denzel Washington is obviously a guy who you trust regardless of what the genre is Chris Pratt is a guy who I've become a huge fan of over the last couple of years as most everybody else has i love seeing ethan hawk in this trailer i love the way that they set it up it's going to be a fun action movie and you're right christian book at the helm is the right guy to be doing this reboot i loved everything about this trailer yep. yeah i loved it too uh, especially uh, me and dennis did a reaction for it this morning and fuqua and, and hawk and denzel all together again since training day that's cool add d'onofrio to the mix add all these other guys it just looks like a fun film pratt definitely the comedic you know He's going to be the jokester, but it's, it feels like it's a natural fit. Like he's got to be a little crazy. So I'm all in, man. I think that the, this teaser trailer is fun. And and the, yeah, I like the, the villain whose name escapes me, but you get you know him when you God. see him. No, we were yeah. talking about him. He's yeah. like instantly slimy. Yeah. He's like Always instantly evil. Slimy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even though he's not like a physically intimidating presence, it's just like you just feel like he's pulling the strings yeah. behind the it's, scenes. It's his body of work that yeah. has gotten to your subconscious because the thing that always gets to me is he was so despicable in, in Boys Don't Cry. Mm, um, yes. And it always, it's, it's always there. It's how good of an actor he is too, but that, that role is Oh, wait, there. here's my impersonation of him in Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so bad. There it is. Yeah, not his, not his fault, yeah. though. Not his I know. fault. Uh, but the movie, you know, I, I said it yesterday, and it looked like it's going to be... It, Ethan Hawke is someone I'm really looking forward to mm -hmm. in this movie because he looks like the Giovanni Ribisi in Saving Private Ryan, ah, like the sniper. Totally. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really, really happy about this trailer. Another trailer that dropped that is not on our list is Girl on a Train. Uh, the Girl on a Train, it just really, Emily Blunt is in this film, and it is a book that I know Wendy over here at Collider has read, and she was, she was screaming about how much she loved it. I didn't read the book. I know that the book, like, people were really over the moon with this thing. I right. saw the trailer. Trailer to me was good. It definitely had a Gone Girl vibe totally. to it for sure. I liked the Kanye song with it. I know you're gonna. We, well, you and I will talk. What about are you talking that about? <laughs> what, what part? What part of that? Oh, the, the, the entire trailer. Yeah, that song. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, that song. I liked, but I liked the trailer though. I did. I, I think it, it. Do I? Did I love it? No, I think because why did I say that like John Lovitz? Did, did I, did I <laughs> love it? Did I love it? No. no. I'll still talk about it. Um, the girl on the train. The girl on the train. Is she in? Is she out? Where right, is she? Wherever she is, I'm following her. Okay. Hey, brilliant. <laughs> um, but I think that it, Emily Bunn, I think just because I just saw The Huntsman and it was her worst performance, mm. Ooh, now yeah. seeing her do this, I'm like, okay, she's back. Yeah. What do you think of the trailer, Scott? I really like the trailer. I thought, I mean, I haven't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not even planning on seeing The Huntsman, so I'll be skipping that. But I love Emily Blunt, and I think she's a great actress, and this trailer. Though it might give a little bit 
too much away, I think, the way they cut it. It's like you don't really know how it's going to go, but mm -hmm. obviously she dyes her hair at some point. So she's suspect in some weird way. It definitely had that Gone Girl flavor to it. Right. Uh, but intrigued me enough to I really want to see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I the musically, I would prefer the House of the Rising Sun cover <laughs> over what we saw in, right. in The Girl on the Train. But this is a movie I've been looking forward to since I heard the premise. The yeah. premise is just so, it's, it's spellbinding to me. And the trailer didn't really spell out exactly what's right. going to be going down in this movie and i like that keep me in the dark as far as what exactly goes down who knows what is this is emily blunt just this person on a train she starts seeing what looks like an idyllic life and then suddenly it starts to go all wrong mm. and she's the only person that knows it you know who surprised me with how shouldn't surprise me but allison janney was so good in this oh, trailer love as, she's janney. just like the hard nose no nonsense interviewing emily blunt what do you know tell me everything and uh I, you're right christian after seeing emily blunt and the huntsman Anything is better, yeah. and I think this movie is going to be one to look out for this fall. Did they release an Emily Blunt movie on, four, on 420, a trailer on purpose? <laughs> oh, that's something to... I think this is more that, that they're just so worried about how bad the what Huntsman is. What is this number you keep... Why do you keep saying 420? <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? Emily Blunt. Blunt. Yeah, Blunt. Flimp. Out. Plump. <laughs> All right, you guys have been commenting already. Continue to do so. Do did you like the Girl on a Train trailer? Did you like the Magnificent trailer? Uh, Magnificent Seven trailer. Comment and tell us exactly what you thought of them. Ashley, what is next? With filming now underway, Justice League is continuing to add to their already impressive list of supporting actors with a new addition to the cast announced via THR. Willem Dafoe is the latest actor to join and the second from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies, the first being J.K. Simmons, who will be playing Commissioner Gordon. THR's report says his part is being kept under lock and key, only to say that he is playing a good guy in the movie. Justice League Part 1 opens November 17, 2017. 17, and also stars Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, Gal Gadot, Ezra Miller, Jason Momoa, and Ray Fisher. Schnapp, what do you think of Willem Dafoe in Justice League? Wait a minute, how can Henry Cav Cavill be in it? He, oh. Uh, <laughs> Willem Dafoe? I love Willem Dafoe. I, I think he's fantastic. I don't believe for a second, though, that they cast him as a good guy. The only thing I think, he the, if he's a good guy, he's playing Harvey Dent before he becomes Two-Face. He is born to play a villain in these kind of superhero films. So I seriously hope it's just some subterfuge like, yeah, he's a good guy called Dark Side, whatever. It's like, that's what I'm hoping. He's a good, he's an amazing actor. So he could play a good guy or a bad guy. I'm happy they cast him. I don't care who he's playing, really, but I secretly hope that he's playing a supervillain. I actually am on the other side. I want to see him play a good guy because I, one of my favorite roles of his that he actually played a good guy was in Platoon. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, I loved him. Different in different roles obviously yeah. in the superhero movies. He he's already done the the Green Goblin thing, which is fun. But if you go back, it, it's and, and it's, it's Raimi direction as well too, which is fine. But it's you didn't overly, get to you didn't get to see his face. He was wearing a mask. But when he did before he got into the, the thing too, he was. It, but I I don't need to see him as a bad guy again. I kind of like. I think that when he plays kind of the calm presence or the good guy it works as well because that's the kind of actor that he is um, I wouldn't be upset if sure. he played a bad guy but I also wouldn't be upset if he played a good guy but adding him in general it's great he's a, he's a phenomenal talent he can't play a good guy he played Jesus Schnapp. he right. played Jesus and he's going to be back as Jesus in the Justice League he's I, loved him, to save all I loved him as Jesus <laughs> in the yeah, last so look, temptation of Christ in it the was last amazing. temptation is great Marty Scorsese, Scorsese classic from the late 80s Harvey uh, Keitel rocking that New York accent I don't know that you're going to get a lot of biblical overtones in this movie but I do believe he's going to be a good guy take them at their word I don't think they're trying to pull a fast one on us but he maybe gets corrupted by the second Justice League movie mm. either way Willem Dafoe is a tremendous actor you know what I always remember him from is clear and present danger he played the uh like the head of that like little resistance he's just hanging out down south like south of the border and he's just like that military rogue mm -hmm. operative the black op guy he's great in roles like that I have no idea if it's going to be more like Platoon or it's going to be more like The Last Temptation of Christ whatever his his role is going to be he's going to be awesome this he's a credit to whatever movie he's in i got a question yep. what if he's playing what if they cast him to play john johns the martian manhunter you think that that's a possibility i mean they haven't announced how you know, old is that character well he's kind of he's he can play any age really because okay. he's a shapeshifter but he is i've always seen him like he's an older like in his 50s martian or mm -hmm. whatever you know however martians age he's slightly older well when you're hunting men and they're on a different planet it ages you <laughs> I know. it's a, it's a stressful got, job. he does have a slightly weird name martian yeah. manhunter yeah. what's up dude it's like he's why like, do i have to be the martian man? why I can't i just be a manhunter what, yeah. what do you have to like like, like profile me from yeah. what planet i'm from well, can't i just be a hunter <laughs> yeah i'm just yeah. a dude yeah from mars yeah 
<laughs> All right, what's next? No, Avengers Age of Ultron was a box office smash. It didn't quite hit the mark with fans, especially as the original Avengers did. A fact that director Joss Whedon is very aware of. At a Q&A with Mark Ruffalo at the Tribeca Film Festival, Whedon addressed the perception of Age of Ultron and his feelings on it from a port via Vulture. On the movie itself, he said, Ultron, I'm very proud of, but there are things that did not meet my expectations of myself, and I was so beaten down by the process. Some of that was conflict with Marvel, which is inevitable, but a lot of that was about my own work. When asked directly if he thought the movie was a failure, Whedon said, the fact that Marvel gave me that opportunity twice is so bonkers and so beautiful, and the fact that I come off of it feeling like a miserable failure is also bonkers, but not in a cute way. It becomes problematic. Mark, do you agree with what Joss Whedon said about Age of Ultron? I mean, I, I think that's the way he feels. I don't personally agree that. I thought Age of Ultron was a really awesome movie. I loved watching that thing. Was it the best movie I've ever seen? No. Was it as good or was it as tight a piece as The Avengers? Of course not. But there's a lot of great stuff in there. And Whedon, I don't know why we're talking about this. I don't know why he continues to talk about this other than the fact that he is a guy, he's a very good public speaker. Joss Whedon mm -hmm. loves talking. And sometimes he loves hearing himself talk. So when you use the press as therapy sometimes it just all this sort of stuff comes out whether all this is intentional or not or it's timing because people are asking him about Avengers mm. the Civil War is about to come out and maybe this maybe Civil War which I see it's tonight yeah. I see Civil War tonight Yay. <laughs> don't pander to me um, it's a golf club I, yeah I, I appreciate it's it it's a happy clap dude it's, come on I, yeah, I know I know I know what you guys are thinking yeah. um so I I, I don't think that Joss Whedon necessarily looks back on that as the best time in his career. And I like that he does take a lot of fault or perceived fault himself. Mm. And he said, yeah, there's some conflict with Marvel, which is inevitable, but he also just feels like he let himself down because he might have just invested too much of himself in the process, which is going to happen because it's a huge movie franchise. Well, I yeah. think that's exactly what you're saying, though. That it's because Civil War's coming out. Right. That's why he's bringing this up. And I think there's so much press that how much people love it already. And, it's, and you know, they go, well, it's, the conversation's going to happen. Well, Ultron was kind of a letdown. Now, this one is now, it, we're, we're back. You know? So he's probably hearing that. Right. But I'll tell you, a lot of times, and you and I have spoken about this on the air, there where Joss Whedon sometimes just talks and he says things. It's just like, dude, stop, mm -hmm. be quiet. This is not one of those times for me. I actually respect his comments very much in the fact that he he took responsibility for his own things that was going on with him, the things that he wanted to do, and he also but he also admitted that there was some clashes sometimes with Marvel, which happens in the process. Right. Which I really enjoyed those comments because it's look. He's a guy that is very, he's stuck in his opinions, but he's, he is where he is because he's stuck in his opinions and he likes, he's a creative dude, mm -hmm. so he's gonna, sometimes he's gonna conflict. And he says that, I like it more when he's talking about it's kind of an equal thing to more when it's- when Not it's, blaming. Yeah, and it was just blaming because some people said it was a bad movie and then he's like, well, it's all Marvel's fault. It, and, the after the movie and, and I like that. I, I like that he didn't throw Marvel under the bus. Yeah. He, he wasn't like, well, maybe if Marvel and, liked me as much as like the Roost. He didn't say any of that. And stuff. he's done right. stuff like that in the past. So to see him step it up and and, and say, and because he is, he, he is really hard on himself. Right. He's been hard on himself in the past two and past interviews too. So to see him do this, I, I, re I respected his comments very much. And, you know, that maybe he wanted to do Ultron differently mm -hmm. and maybe there's other things and then again bringing in the fact that he was appreciative that he was able to do it twice right. and that he still it, it's you, every one of us knows it as a director and as comedians it's like you there's things that you could have done better yeah. even if you had a great set even if you had a great you know shoot there's still the edit didn't come out the way you wanted to the joke could have been a little tighter no nah, you know, nah, it's so pretty tight full it's of pretty crap <laughs> uh, but, but you know what I mean so like so I understand and I, I really respect the comments and hats off to Joss Whedon for, for a great uh, for a great interview yeah, I like a uh, specific like, uh, you know, it's problematic, not in a cute way, because he's basically saying, you know, hey, a lot of the things that happen in that film, you know, I'm guilty of just as much as anybody else in like, you know, I, I got a chance to visit uh, the Avengers set uh, Age of Ultron in London and watched him and he was kind of he was halfway through the, the shoot, which was a, a harsh, harsh schedule, nonstop shoot. He was limping. He had hurt himself. He was right, tired. Yeah. And it was like, yo, you've got another like 60 days to go. It was like, it was a pretty brutal shoot. And I watched it for like three days and I was like, wow, the guy, you got to give him a lot of credit. I mean, he, I, Avengers number one is still my favorite team superhero film yet. It's still my favorite. And uh, 
Age of Ultron, yeah, it's not as good as Avengers, and it's a lot of other films. Like I, I I'll say I like Civil War better than Age of Ultron. I think it's a better film. That's not saying anything negative about Joss Whedon or his creativity or his imagination or his abilities as a writer or director. It's just I think there was a, you know, there was some of this back and forth between him and some of the people at Marvel where it became kind of like a tug of war. I think. And that happened while they were shooting all the way through to the final edit. And I think that's a little apparent in the film. But Age of Ultron has amazing sequences in it. And it's also it really is a great continuation of, you know, seeing all these characters like the Avengers move forward. So I wouldn't you know, I wish he wasn't as hard on himself with Age of Ultron. It's not a failure, you know. It's it's interesting to see somebody like at his position be human about it. Yeah, though. that's right. that's what I really like, admire. Because it's not yeah. just the the filmmaking process, but it's also whether there's a backlash that comes, whether oh this movie wasn't as good as the previous effort you made. Like that hurts people. Like people have feelings. They right. get their feelings hurt. Not everybody is Martian manhunting and they're just so tough and they're by <laughs> themselves. Like the pre all this stuff affects a human being too. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice to see somebody be like, yeah, it, it's it sucks, you know. Right. And I'm and I'm as hard on myself as anybody else is. I like my artists to be like that yeah. you know yeah okay now it's time for buy or sell ash is going to read down some more stories in the world of movie news and myself schnepp and ellis and you guys will either buy or sell it that's right if you hear the topic when you hear the topic hit it buy it or sell it ashley what's up first End of the tour director James Ponsold has signed on to direct I Want My MTV, a movie based on the book chronicling the creation of MTV and its first decade of the network's existence that became a cultural icon. A24, the studio behind Room, The Witch, and upcoming Green Room is behind the adaptation, which is described as a fun, immersive look at the network's rise through testimonials and celebratory accounts of a one-of-a-kind cultural moment. Ponsold released a press release for the movie saying, as a child of the 1980s, MTV had a massive impact on me, and I'm so excited to again be working with my friends at A24 and exploring the storied early years of the groundbreaking channel. No release date has been set. Christian, by or sell Ponsold's I Want My MTV. Huge buy for me. The fact that A24 is doing this, the fact that this could be like a, another um, Facebook uh, social network type of movie. And yeah, I just like I like the comments behind it. It was a big time uh, during pop culture and MTV before it just you know turned into a network that didn't show music television <laughs> at all. But it, it it did so much for the generation when it came out too, and and it did have a huge impact on celebrity culture. And it, I think the movie could be a lot of fun. And they said it's going to be fun. I don't want it to be a straight up drama. It doesn't seem like it's going to be from the synopsis that Ashley just read. So this could be pretty promising. I think that um, this might be a movie that you watch and go, man, did you see the MTV movie? Everyone's going to be talking about the MTV right. movie. I, I'm, I, I'm going to buy it. I want my MTV. You That's why I, I, I totally buy this. <laughs> um, yeah, there is no more reason to have an MTV now. We have you, you are in control of any music video you want to watch on YouTube or any other of these streaming services. You control it. You pick, oh, I want to watch this. And there's like a group of other, like you go down the the wormhole, the YouTube wormhole, and you're like, I've just watched 50. Now I'm into, I'm into like the gr grunge metal. You know, it's like I started out with like the talking heads. So who knows? I mean, I think uh, I want my MTV is a really good idea. We're going to get to see all those VJs, video jockeys. Remember that terminology? Yep. All this kind of weird terminology. And yes, back when they showed 24 hours a day music videos, MTV is not what it was and never can be what it was. So it's cool to document that kind of historic moment when it really became an iconic presence where you actually had to watch MTV because you wanted to stay in tune with all these cool videos that were you know popping off. Yeah, that's right. It's a huge buy for me. I mean, there's two cable networks that were launched around the same time that both have huge cultural relevance up to this day, and that's ESPN and MTV. And both of them, you could argue that the behind the scenes stuff as far as getting those networks off the ground is just as interesting as anything they were putting in front of the camera. So getting to see that, you're right, Jeff, with like all the different VJs going on and what MTV TV meant for as far as a cultural divide between what parents thought was acceptable and what kids thought was acceptable. It was a world of difference. It was a continental divide once MTV came out because parents were like, oh, no, no, kids shouldn't be watching that. And kids were like, this is the greatest thing of all time. So seeing that be the backdrop for what all the politics are going on at Viacom and MTV, this is going to be great. Not to mention the fact that I'm also kind of a huge fan of a lot of the music that came out during that era. Totally. So you're going to get your Van Halen, your Michael Jackson, right. your Def Leppard, all those 
those great music videos. Hopefully, will play some sort of role in this movie. I'm shocked. The it's it's kind of split here, and I wonder if it's a generation thing as right. well too, because it's like some people. <laughs> it's a funny comment. I saw. I'd rather have a VH1 movie. <laughs> um, but there is a it's it splits. There's a lot of buys, a lot a lot of sells. I have more sells than I thought. But hey, there we go. Kids, before MTV was MTV, it was MTV. <laughs> I know. Right. I totally get what you meant by I saying know. that, by the way. It's That's very so meta, but I think Actually, I just would you want to see an MTV movie? Um, definitely. When I was a kid, my goal in life was, I mean, maybe a 90s, but I really wanted to be a VJ. That's what I wanted to be when it's, I was a kid. It was so. still they showed music videos when you were They did. Up? So TRL. Yeah. Like, videos. I wanted to host TRL. I wanted to be Carson oh. Daly. Ashley, you are a VJ right I now. I am. I'm like you the modern the VJ. Yes, Ashley. On YouTube. The right. dreams come true here dreams on Moonlight. Dreams come true. All right, what's next? The latest entry in the Fast and Furious franchise, Furious 8 is currently filming with new director straight out of Compton, F. Gary Gray, behind the camera. To get the fans excited, Vin Diesel released the newest poster on his Facebook page that utilizes the fitting tagline, New Roads Ahead. The movie will bring back the original cast with Charlize Theron joining them as the new villain. The next installment will drive into theaters next year on April 14th. Schnett Byers sell the Furious 8 poster. I buy Vin Diesel as Silver Surfer after looking at that poster <laughs> with Chrome Dome floating around. Um, yeah, no, I buy the poster. It's mysterious. It's it, it's it say says a lot by showing nothing. Is kind of it just shows like new roads ahead. It's kind of a somber looking Vin Diesel. We're probably reflecting on some of the things that happened in the previous movie. So yeah, I buy the poster. I, I think it's a it's a cool entry point to this new Fast and Furious film. I tentatively buy it just because it's. The reason I, I, if I was gonna sell it, it's just because you could show me this poster and tell me it was from number five or number six, sure, <laughs> or, and I'd still say okay, because it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. But the only, the only difference is when you exactly what you just said when you reflect on the fact that the, the loss of Paul Walker mm -hmm. and that it is, and, and they even say it, you know, the new roads ahead. Then you, it's the new roads ahead that makes me buy it mm -hmm. because then that then it's him kind of looking somber, going, okay, this is going to be our first entry now without Paul Walker. Yeah. So that's when you say, okay, it, it's the wording of it's not just the imagery, and it's, it's the it's, emptiness of the space. It's him exactly on, right. It's the side view, his face. It's yes. not. A, it's not. I'm not a tough, dude. It's not a happy. It's like this reflective look and that's so, why i think that i buy it because right the, because the words and the fact of where what we've known has happened in the process of this film why are you laughing Mark? <laughs> i sell this <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous it's you stupid. got this giant it's, grin on your face it's just a dude looking sideways <laughs> at a road like are you lost use your phone get some directions what is he Mark, doing Mark, in the middle of the road by Mark, himself christian <laughs> and i are just kind of like taking it's, it in and creating angry. a story guys, from looking at the poster you guys wove this amazing <laughs> tapestry that's so much better than anything in this poster it's just he's looking sideways like he is me looking at this poster like like really that's it he just looks confused he looks lost he looks like a traveler who who misread a map and now he's looking he also looks like if somebody's presenting him with these new roads that are ahead he's like really do i gotta go he doesn't so look excited about the new adventure this? no I'm, I'm i'm tired of of every movie vin diesel's so reluctant to get back into it and it's like oh, okay fine you'll pull me back in again guess what guys you can get dom toretta to do whatever stupid heist you want him to do he's up for because he's got nothing Nothing better to do. This poster does nothing for me. I, don't, I, I still want to see the movie, but it's, a, it's just a dumb poster. It, it means nothing. I, 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 mean, totally, I, don't even, I don't know where Alice is coming from. You, got, you guys made an amazing movie just now, okay? I like your guys' movie, but the poster is right. ridiculous. I don't even know who you are anymore. All right, what's next? <laughs> the Weinstein Company has released a new trailer for their upcoming sports drama, Hands of Stone, which stars Robert De Niro and Edgar Ramirez as the trainer-fighter duo of Ray Arcel and Roberto Duran, and are R B star Usher as boxing legend Sugar Ray Leonard. Duran's bouts with Leonard drew worldwide attention after he beat Leonard in the first fight, but gave up in the eighth round of the second fight, telling the ref no mas. Hands of Stone is directed and written by Venezuelan filmmaker Jonathan Jakubowicz and hits theaters this August 26th. Mark Byers saw the new trailer for Hands of Stone. I am not saying no, Maz. I'm totally buying this. I know the, the trailer dropped yesterday and, and we watched it and it's it just looks like what you want to see about this story. And I'm a huge fan of boxing movies anyway. You get me in a ring, you'll probably beat the crap out of me. But boxing is just something where, for whatever reason, even if it's not a great boxing film, like Southpaw, I didn't think it was a great film, but it still like inspires you. It inspires you to like do something. And when you have source material that's based on a true story like this, which I don't know if there's ever been a Roberto Duran movie. If there has been, it hasn't been to this profile. And with these fight scenes that look very, very 
very well done. So it's a huge buy for me. Yeah, it's a buy for me as well because I, I'm very familiar with Roberto Duran and with the, the Nomas and the fights with Sugar Ray Leonard. I didn't know that Usher was playing me neither. Sugar Ray Leonard mm -hmm. at all. And he actually, he mm -hmm. was, I mean, it was it was very brief, but he believable and looked all right. And I've seen him in a couple things, and he's been he's been fine. But to play Sugar Ray Leonard, you got to have a lot of charisma. You got to have. I mean, <laughs> you got to be quick. Too. You got to be quick. So I think it, that's a cool role for him to have, and I think that you could, he could prove some stuff to us. I love De Niro as a trainer. I mean, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? That's perfect. So to have to have him in there um, training uh, Roberto Duran, and Dur Duran's got a very very crazy story to tell. He's he's one of these boxers that should have had a movie a long time ago, mm -hmm. and to see him, I wonder if they're gonna show him knock out the small horse. Do you know that story? Mm -hmm. No. No, knocked out a horse with his with his right like hand. Like Alex Karras and Blazing why call, Saddle. That's why they call him Hands of Stone. Now, whether or not you he know, punched he knocked a, out horse? a horse. Now, we're not saying he was, it was a good thing to do. We're just saying yeah, that it's it kind happened. of a dick move. That's it's terrible. A dick, it's, a dick, it's a dick move, but that's why he, it's not like he, the horse was boxing him. No, but the, you know, he's standing there, probably like hanging out. God, but he's so bad. I bet he, if he knocks out a horse, that's why Vin Diesel's like. Uh, but that's what that's how powerful the guy was. You know, should he have done it? No, it's oh, creepy, it's horrible so thing terrible. to do. But he knocked out a horse with his right. right hand. And he did it when he was three years old. Yes. <laughs> Makes it even worse. Guys, weirder. Ashley was so <laughs> excited about being a VJ two segments ago. Yeah. And, and now you brought, brought the mood down, down with animal abuse. Hey, I didn't knock the horse well, out. What's God. next? Is he eating horse meat? <laughs> no. Oh my god. He's just like Scott selling Dark. horse meat. Um you know what? I'm going to steal a quote from the Collider News that where the, the guy who wrote it was like, we're not going to let Robert De Niro go out in a boxing movie with grudge match. So that's why he's back. Ah, I, I thought that was pretty yeah. funny. But uh, yeah, the trailer, I, I, it, it looks like a really well put together trailer. And the story of Roberto Duran is, uh, um, it's Roberto, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just so making sure I don't say his name wrong. But, he uh, will punch you out. I don't want to get punched in the face by Roberto <laughs> Duran at any age. And um, yeah, you know what? It's funny. I saw the trailer and then Christian came in a little bit later and he was like, is that Usher? Because that's exactly what I said out loud when I watched it. Is that Usher? Is it, oh, that is Usher. Cool. Yeah. He's playing just, Sugar Ray Leonard. I'm so. so glad I didn't go yeah. along with Christian when he asked me if I heard of that story. Because like I wanted to lie, just be like, oh, yeah, that was a great fight. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, so, no, he knocked the horse. T, T, T Rose said, well, the horse did hit first. Oh, <laughs> real nice. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, poor horse. Um, that trailer. Unbelievable. Oh, uh, okay, man. what's next? Um, up next is Rewind. Oh, just kidding. So it's time for <laughs> Rewind. Now, Rewind is when we go back in time. We hop into the DeLorean and we talk about the movies that came out 10 and 20 years ago. Ashley has a list of said movies. Mm. What I are do. they? 10 years ago was Silent Hill, American Dreams, The Sentinel, and 20 years ago, Celtic Pride, Mystery Science Theater 3000, and The Substitute. All right. Snap. What wow. stands out? Well, um... Yeah. Silent Hill. There's, there's a lot of silence going on. That was like an interesting video game adaptation. It didn't really do too well as far as how I felt yeah. about it. But uh, um, and then the Mystery Science Theater stands out as like, hey, they got it in the theaters. Now they just they they are doing a brand new series, which I'm really excited about. Um, got a pal Jonah Ray's playing the new guy. So yeah, that's what stands out to me. The other ones I never even heard of. American Dreams sounds like a fabric softener. Um, with the Sentinel. It was like an American Idol spoof movie with Hugh Grant as yeah. like Simon Cowell. Okay, was it good? I, I didn't I never it. heard of it. Yeah, so I yeah. didn't. No. Uh, none of these movies are good. Yeah. And I and I will tell you that I'm looking forward, the way we look forward to summer movies right. and then we look forward to Oscar movies is now this, that season also makes me look forward to Rewind mm. because that's when, you know, like because right. now we're, we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. I'll agree with you for the 10-year movies, the 20-year movies, Celtic Pride is a, is a horrible piece of no, trash. No, 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 no. I'm no, right. you're saying I'm later. Not, what I'm saying yeah. is as we get further not along this time. in May and June and but July. Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. No, that's a good one. Yeah, it's all right, but I mean, it's not like it's wow. funny. Oh, Mystery Science Theater. It was a great TV show. It was show. a great TV show. It was the a movie great, was great. The movie was great. Great. It's right, one of the saw. best ones they've okay, done because saw. they spoofed the movie This Island Earth, mm -hmm. and it is hysterical from start to finish. It's maybe it, if it was an episode of Mystery Science Theater, I would have ranked it in my top ten. Like my favorite one of all time is when they did Mitchell, and then this one would be somewhere in the mix after that because This Island Earth is a ridiculous premise. It's got like a Green Lantern feel yeah. to it. It is so funny, and Tom Servo easy, and easy. Crow. It's got Meta Luna monsters in it. Relax. It's those those just, are my the creatures I collect are those big brain dudes. Oh really? I love the the way they look. The, the movie's pretty corny, but. It's yeah. Yeah. Some but cool watching those guys make fun it. of it, it's something no, that I'm glad Mystery Science Theater has hung around as a cult classic long enough. Now we get a new show. It is some of the best comedy you'll ever see. The group's going along with you, too. Here, A lot of people liked uh, Mystery Science. Mitchell. For sure. Um, some people think that Silent Hill was a good adaptation of the game. Um, I've heard that, too. I've heard people enjoy Silent Hill. Yeah, they said it was average. So 
There I think the Resident Evil, the entire franchise of Resident Evil, is better than the one Silent Hill. I thought I thought for sure they were making a second Silent Hill. Did they make one? Oh yeah, they did. Something uh, horrible. Okay. Okay. Now before we get into mailbag, we mentioned yesterday every Friday now uh, at two p.m. we have the movie trivia schmodown. Big matches have gone down from Campia Dan Merle. We've had Clark Wolf versus Makuga, and this week the man sitting to my left. John Schnapp will be going up against Finstock. And before we talk to you about it, we've got right. a little video package for the fans to see. Take it away. Fly me to the moon. Oh, we're doing an interview here? Well, Juan Schnapp, uh, you know, I watched his movie. It's very good. You know, I think he maybe he should stick to that because I don't think he's a trivia guy. Flimpstock or what's his name? Fimpschlock? Something like it. I don't even know really what it means. Is it Woodstock? I don't know where he got the name. Doesn't matter. He's going down. He's embarrassed that, you know, me and JTE took him and Dennis out in, uh, you know, the finals or the semifinals of the, uh, or whatever it was, quarterfinals of the Schmodown. I think he thinks that I pull answers out of my hat or my beard mask. It was all guessing. It was like, uh, one out of two out of three, uh, let me go with three. That's it. Somehow you ma magically guessed it. The three. Uh, Sean Connery. That is correct. Uh, it's uh, the man in the iron mask. That is correct. Uh, body wise. That is correct for wow. one point. Wow, not showing up. Well, wow. They did win. I'm not going to take that away from them, but it wasn't a real win. So that's kind of what I'm looking for right now is actually something that's real and valid, me destroying this simple-minded fool. You know, I don't care who, you know, doesn't have me winning this thing. Me and JTE are still vying for a championship, a tag team championship. We're in the finals. Oh, my God. Finstock is a guy who, you know, he has flashy cars, he's got money, he's got girls, he, you know, does everything great around town, hobnobs with celebrities, that's all true. But I'm not known for trivia, and I'm going to change that. Finstock, uh, Frifflefiff, whatever your name is again, the mask kid, um, sorry that you guessed your way into uh, fighting me again, this time I'm taking you out for real. This is the death of Juan Schnepp. What happened? Finstock happened. Well, there you go. Goes down on Friday. Schnepp versus Finstock. And we put a poll up yesterday. The poll, 89% of the viewers think that Schnepp, you are going to not only be uh, victorious, but you're going to be our first knockout in the new league. What do you have to say about Finstock and the fact that he calls you Juan Schnepp? Well, you know, like uh, he's got a lot of fanatics out there, and I'm like, I gotta just tell you, Chimpstock, he's going, and he's, he's got a he's got a lucky streak. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue that. I mean, me and Dennis went against him and JLX or whatever that other dude's name is. We went against them, JLX. and somehow, I mean, it was me and Dennis. You know, we're pretty smart dudes. We got beat up. We got destroyed. And you know, it's it's that luck that you know. If anything, you know, I'm gonna give Finstock that edge on on just like a goofy, almost moronic, <laughs> ape-like way of kind of pulling out an answer or being able to just get that edge just by pure luck. So that might happen, but you know, I'm sorry, Flimpy, um, <laughs> Flimpy. coming at you. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, look, it's never it's never considered professional for the announcers to comment on who they think is going to win. But Christian, this is this this seems to be a horse punch. This seems to be <laughs> where right. going to just walk. Let me just say, we might be three thousand miles from Graceland, <laughs> but I'm not going to be punching any camels. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so there you go, guys. Make sure if you haven't watched the movie Trivia Schmodown, you don't want to miss this, miss this one at all. It is going to be up at 2 p.m. PST on this channel here, so go check it out and watch some of the past matches as well. Um, we are getting into mailbag, and before we get into mailbag, one of the things we wanted to let you guys know is that we want to be more active with you guys and let you guys know if you submit to collidervideo at gmail.com, we want to get a lot of different questions here on on movie talk like from all over the board it can be from from superhero movies star wars classics uh any movies that you love like just 
everything. We want to go all over. The, every time we go and we pick up new categories on Mailbag, we want to make sure that there's we're covering all range of film. Yeah, sometimes I like the deeper thought questions, too, where one of my favorite Mailbags of all time was, uh, was they just gave us a premise. They're like, okay, so you can either have seen all the movies you've seen up to this date and then never see another new movie, or you wipe away all the movies you've already seen and you just get to see new movies. Which one do you take? Which one's a really fun yeah, yeah, I like What did those. you go with? I, I, I went with my past. Well, how about you? Yeah. Uh, everything past, everything in my yeah. life now is gravy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, that, that's when you are submitting collidervideo at gmail.com. Just think about it. There are a lot of questions that we get. Think of something different. Think of something new. And that is most likely how we're going to choose the question. So, go collidervideo <laughs> at gmail.com. Speaking of mailbag, now it is time. Ashley, what are they saying out there? Ben Rayner writes, hello, Movie Talk crew. Big fan here since the early days at AMC. I love all the new content. I have a question about the Avatar movies. With the four more sequels coming out, I have a question about the actors. Are they going to be filming back to back to back to back with all the actors all the same time? What does that mean for all their other movies like Zoe Saldana and the MCU? Does that mean she won't be in those movies anymore if the filming is at the same time? Which movie should she be in? Thank you for all your time and effort and may the force be with you mm. it's gonna be tough it's a great question because you know you've got to take in consideration all the actors um schedules and right. maybe you're gonna be adding new characters throughout and you you assume that they've cast the majority of it. they're shooting that many movies back to back to back to back um but they're also gonna have to be aware of schedules and yeah. i think that when they're making the schedules they'll have to schedule around certain actors and they'll have to uh be very very aware of the fact that you're gonna have people for certain amounts of time so uh, that's the only thing i can think of what do you think Chef? yeah you know i think it's a great thing i was happy to hear that he's shooting f a, a fourth one so he's right. in four sequels and you got to look at it like this like we we've come to expect television shows like oh they shot daredevil season two literally like six months ago, and we got 13 hours of season two. Now this, obviously, Avatar is a completely different beast. Most, most of it's gonna be motion capture, most of it's gonna be shot against blue or green screen. But within that technology, they could shoot Zoe uh, Saldana, because she's a 3D character mm. in this film, they could shoot her for a month, and that's all of the four movies. They, so that, my guess is that they're, they've got all four scripts, and they're gonna like piece by piece by piece shoot it all out of order and get all the actors uh, motion capture done and all their dialogue done and people always come in for ADR and looping and things like that later for every film as each film is done um, but you get the rough cuts you get the rough tracks you get all the motion capture done so I think that's what James Cameron is going to be doing is he's going to be filming and banking all of the characters and all that motion captured data and I think the probably the tougher roles but once again will also be shot against blue screen are the actual human beings not the 3D characters because they won't be motion captured they'll be acting against something that's maybe not there so it's hard to tell but I think it's a very smart move because it actually makes it frees up all the actors time they'll be like no I, I did all four sequels over the course of like five months so I think it's a smart idea you guys are just describing every reason why I never want to make movies like this is such a <laughs> headache yeah. like this is just one big Advil scenario but it can be alleviated because you can plan out you can game plan for stuff like look okay we have four movies we want to plot out first of all who dies how how you know is everybody going to survive from movie two through movie five like okay so you shoot these scenes here you shoot these and the scheduling conflicts they're going to be a nightmare but they can be ironed out and it's not like let's say they go off to some cave for six months mm -hmm. and they film as much as they possibly can for the four movies it's not like okay that's all we're ever allowed to shoot like we now we have picture lock no Zoe Saldana can go off and do another movie or if Sam Worthington's in he can go do another movie then mm -hmm. come back and then shoot more if you need to do pickups or something like that I think in this case the technology helps avatar that you can actually yeah. plug in actors when they don't necessarily have to be there physically to do their roles there's enough of stuff like schnapp said you can bank and i think that that's going to really be an asset to making all these movies back to back to back to god that sounds how is james cameron joss whedon had trouble just doing age of ultron after Avengers. how is james cameron, cameron gonna do four it's so movies? risky he, what, oh, he's a so monster risky. though remember he's like he's that guy who thrives off of like pushing himself to the limit so but he's out of shape he, he hasn't <laughs> done a movie since he like like what was the, he did avatar right and then he went under the sea for right. like 10 years so well, now like, he's back he, doing he has movies. risen like poseidon like a <laughs> phoenix and he's like eating them for breakfast give me a movie Can i worry I about i worry about you jimmy i'm worried about it too just to see like i said when we announced the story in the front when we were talking about the story when it was first announced was that it, it's just i don't if that second movie isn't good 
and then you've already <laughs> invested in the third yeah. and the fourth and the fifth. It's like, you know what I mean? That's like that's that's it's one thing if like the first one is it is what it is. I happen to really enjoy it, but there's people there's the haters. The second one's great, mm. and then the third one's not good. Okay, because then you can try with the fourth one. But then if the fourth one's not bad, you're still doing a fifth one. It's really, really risky. It's risky, but think about it like I just think about it like movies are like giant television shows now. I mean, when with these sequels at the way they build them, so they're built out like a season arc yeah. that'll take place over six years that we'll see cinematically. And you should trust in Cameron. For I totally sure. trust Cameron. I if get there's it. anybody that I trust more, it's James Cameron. All yeah. of his films, even the ones, a couple that I was like, eh, they were still really pleasing and fun. And I, I have a lot of faith in James Cameron, okay? But but I don't have as much faith in just the, the human body and the human mind holding up for that for, for a stress under that amount of time the the genius thing that star wars did when, when george lucas was making the prequels is that the prequels we already knew that mythology and where it was leading right. so even if phantom menace wasn't great or we didn't love attack of the clones we all still wanted to see revenge of the sith mm -hmm. because we know what's coming we right. know we get an epic lightsaber battle between anakin and obi-wan and we're going to see darth vader become darth vader with this stuff on pandora i have no idea but is what's that coming what to look forward to so if there's a bad movie why do i want to come back to see something that I'm not aware of in the first place. But the, the reverse of that is it's all new stuff. Why do you want to know? It's like I would rather be so shocked and surprised by every movie. It's a new adventure. It's not something that, oh, I'm waiting for this thing to happen. Right. Sure. There's, that's the flip side. Uh, all right. What's next? Neil Baxter writes, hi, guys. Love your work crew. Just wondered what's your favorite gangster film, what your favorite gangster film was. There are so many greats to choose from, but my choice is The Untouchables. Thoughts? Mm. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. That's right. <laughs> I love that movie. It's a great movie. But baseball uh, bats coming yeah. up. I actually really enjoy. I mean, Goodfellas. Goodfellas is, is my my yeah. favorite of all time. I think it's. I, yeah, I can see the arguments for either Godfather one or two. I I completely I get it. Um, I love the guilty not the guilty pleasure, but some people like Scarface. I enjoy as well. But I think for me, my favorite gangster film is uh, Goodfellas. Angels with Dirty Faces, really? 1938. Is that, is that really uh, famous? It's not, but it is a joy a to one. watch. Yeah. Like everybody gets introduced by it from Home Alone, and then you see, and then you're like, oh, that's a real movie that they made, and it's it's good. James Cagney's awesome. Is man. that the Grapefruit in the Face movie? Fruit in the Face movie. Yeah. Is that it? I think uh, so. the one at the like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Snap. Well, I mean, you know, it's like you named all of them that are yeah. pretty awesome. You got, I mean, I don't really have a favorite in the in this genre. I I love Goodfellas. I love Casino. I love uh, Casino is a good one. Too, Once yeah. upon a time Casino. in America yeah. Oh, yeah. is also an incredible film, and it's got a great cast: James Woods, Robert De Niro, directed by Sergio Leone. I'd have to say, like you know, it's probably between The Godfather one and two, and Once Upon a Time in America, as far as like older type gangster films. Scarface yeah. is an incredible the original gangster. one, or the or the Pacino? no, the Pacino mm -hmm. one. The yeah. Pacino yeah. one, I absolutely love. Uh, mean Streets, uh, Mean, mean Streets. Streets from the early seventies, seventy three, uh, I think. Yeah. And um, City of God is one people are talking about. American City of Gangster, yeah. Donnie Brazil. Brasco, American Gangster is really good. Uh, yeah. Departed. Uh, the yeah. town, New Jack City, the some town is a great like you know, yeah. Boston gangster drama. Yeah, and but Road it's like Perdition. when you think gangsters, it's sort of like when you think gangsters, you definitely do think like Al Pacino, yeah. uh, you know, De Niro doing the you know the um, Untouchables. But yeah, for me, definitely Goodfellas is one of the most enjoyable, rewatchable gangster yeah. flicks. So gotta go Boys in the Hood for a gangster movie too. It's, it's pretty gangster. gangster. Yeah, yeah, it is gangster. Yeah. 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 Right. Gangsta. Okay, so we are now getting to the live Twitter questions. You guys have tweeted out at Collider Video. Ashley Mova has been going through them. She's picking them out. Ashley, what are they saying out there? Um, Sterling Jones writes, "What's your favorite mystery film that you can watch multiple times?" Oh man, mystery film. Clue. My favorite is Blue Velvet. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. What's what? Where he find, found an ear? It's like trying to find out who's the rest of the body. Yeah. It's really, seven. It's, seven count. It's a mystery kind of thriller. Seven yeah, is sure, definitely yeah. counts. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. 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 I would say that. I mean, look, Psycho is a mystery for a little bit because you're not really sure what exactly is going on, and then you mm -hmm. find out. Oh my God, oh, that's the they're disturbing. the same. Thing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'd say Psycho, but Clue is. Uh, Clue, it's, it, that's a clear indication that it's it's all about the journey and not necessarily the destination with that movie. It's sure. so much fun. A lot of fun. All right, what's next? David Kogel writes, my question is, what is your most upsetting death in a, in a film? I would say Brian Cranston in Godzilla. Well, yeah, because he was wasted. Yeah, he's only in the movie for five minutes. That's yeah. upsetting. I mean, upsetting as far as like when people were... <laughs> You know, uh, wasted, and that's a good one. As far as I just have to think about it, emotional impact wise, but I think that um, you know, you know, which one was tough was uh, in in Saving Private Ryan 
when Adam Goldberg, uh, mm. when he goes out after Upham screws him, uh, like that scene, man. Like, Upham. yeah. Well, that's <laughs> that scene when he's just going. It was it was such a human scene with him and the and the German soldier when they were going. And it's just like no, 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 and you just you feel him die. You right. feel it. It's, and it's it's a horrible, horrible death, and and one of the more upsetting ones. And if you talk about ones that's kind of that was shocking, um, was Drew Barrymore in the beginning of Scream. Mm. You know, a meaningful death for me is Roy Batty, uh, Rutger Hauer in Blade Runner. Mm. I know Ellis, you haven't seen it yet. It's not a spoiler, yet. but uh, it's an amazing uh, death sequence, and you know he says a, a beautiful poem before he goes away. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to root against humans in movies, so every chance I get, so like I, I don't, I don't feel as much for humans. But like, like we we did the Return of the Jedi commentary, which by the way is up right now on the Collider Video channel. You can check yeah. it out. Yeah, no, it goes up at two. It goes up at two today, and you guys can see just how much I react to that Ewok eating it. Like they, they, I'm sure a bunch of Ewoks died in the Battle of Endor, but they only show one really get capped, and his friend is like trying to hug him and like, oh, it's get gonna up, be okay. Yeah, he's just dead. Rub. And then, and then the other guy, instead of getting up and running for his life, realizing his friend is dead, he just takes a nap next to a he dead corpse him. and yeah. is like, I guess him. I'll die with you. It's amazing stuff. But the the, the death that really gets me is uh, it's it's a dog. Oh. And um, it's Marley. an Owen Wilson movie, mm. and it's got Jennifer Aniston in it, and it's pretty much about my family's history. And uh, Marley and me just it's tearing up right now. Just wrecks me. Uh, you're gonna love this one. So this is from Bruce Lee. Oh, hey, Bruce. Steven Seagal in Executive Order. I knew you'd love that. Executive one, Decision. Uh, executive Decision. Okay. Uh, executive Decision. Uh, Cyclops and X Three. Dobby is a great one. Dobby's a great one. The dog and John Wick. Uh, oh, come on. Let's see what else. There's some good ones. Favorite here. death. The yeah. dog and John Wick. That's. A, I don't want to see that. <laughs> not, again. not favorite. Just an Im impact. An impact. Yeah, yeah. Because again, like my hey, you know favorite. what? I'll I'll kill everyone with up. That yeah, guy in the beginning ooh, when yeah. his, his wife one, dies, one. everyone's yeah. crying in the first five minutes. Thank you, Pixar. Yeah. That's it. It's like, <laughs> How about that uh, pony at Roberto Duran's place? That's pretty uh, right. <laughs> Got to be punching that horse. Yeah, it's not cool, dude. I hope that's in the deleted scenes. Yeah. What's what's next? Darren McMullen writes, what is the most misleading trailer that you've seen? Mine is Bridget Terabithia. Oh, I have to, think about I have oh, to I say, I for me, uh, the question. Horse Puncher, the trailer for Horse, <laughs> horse Puncher, Puncher was the most misleading. <laughs> but the sequel, Donkey Puncher, was yeah, amazing. I saw that five times. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go with The Village. The Village oh, was yeah. just such a... Shama, Shama, whatever you want to say about the guy, he his people cut great trailers, mm -hmm. and The Village was so misleading as to what that movie was. I need to go back and watch The Village, knowing what I know now, Let's and see be if cops. it holds up at all. Let's Be Cops was a misleading trailer for me because I thought the movie was going to be hilarious mm -hmm. from the trailer. And like literally the way the trailer was cut, I was like, oh, those are all the funny moments, and then... There's this other part of the story that's not good. Yeah, comedies will do that too. I, uh, I thought Let's Be Cops was fine, but I'll steal another Shyamalan movie. What do you got? Last Airbender. Last Airbender trend, uh, trailer was really good and made it seem like it was going to be a really epic, fun, um, uh -huh. brand new right. introduction into the fantasy world, and it was anything but that. Oh, it yeah. was. I'll steal another Shyamalan from all of y'all. Okay. Lady in the Water. Yeah. Though that yeah. sucks because the trailer wasn't that good, so I'm just joking. But, but it had the name Shyamalan, yeah. and at but the But you know time. what? The Counselor, Ridley Scott's movie, The Counselor, saw the trailer. I was like, wow, the all-star cast. This looks amazing. It's written by the guy from Old Country for Old Men, directed by Ridley Scott. I cannot wait to see this horrible film. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's take uh, two more. Okay, Joe Tracy writes, do you think we'll get a Kobe movie, and who should play him? Ellis, we can take that one. So you're going to get a Kobe movie, and Never. who should play him? Who should play Kobe? Um, man, if you... Uh, it's tough because uh, I think I have the game to play Kobe. I just think I'd have to go through some physical transformations in order to pull it off. I don't think it's going to be a Kobe movie on that kind of scale. I mean, there hasn't been a Jordan movie, has been a Bird movie, hasn't been a Magic movie on that level. There's been they might have made some made for TV movies, but to make a movie about a superstar athlete that is as well known today as somebody like Kobe Bryant, it's damn near impossible to pull off. And I don't know Kobe. Yeah. I don't know that Kobe's life really warrants the the big screen treatment because he was overseas as a kid. He he, he played at a lot of different places. He I mean, He's a great basketball player. It doesn't mean he had an interesting Actually, life. You're a hater. Face, what like, do you mean he doesn't warrant a big screen movie? Hang on a he's second. Basically, he's basically a rich kid who went from, from country to country to Just get good at basketball. Just because he's rich doesn't mean he, didn't, he, did, he worked hard. What's, what's the story? I mean, he worked hard to get to where he is. No one just gets there overnight, and but he's a legend. Couldn't like, the argument be made, legend. though, that so is Jordan. There's no movie for Jordan. Well, yeah, yeah, make I, one for him, too. Make one for him, too. I think the casting is very important because we yeah, need I'll to 
make sure it's global. It's so uh, Scarlett Johansson should play Kobe in the movie just so we get a Perfect. global. Yeah. yeah. And then if That's not good. her, at least Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> Perfect. It's got to. You have to get that global market. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. I don't know. Great I mean, because Michael B. Jordan was talking to Kobe, I guess, about. I mean, yeah. obviously, I mean, he's about. He's no, way shorter. But, I would have uh, to give Nate Parker that over. If I had to pick an actor, I, I, both I, super. I mean, they're like yeah, f- foot sm- smaller. But Nate Parker's younger. I think he's a little younger than Michael B. Jordan, so you can kind of you could age him a little bit easier. But really? uh, look, Kobe is one of the greatest basketball players in know. the history of time. He's an absolute killer. He's an assassin. The NBA needs more guys like that. That's something that we need to see a movie. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. What's next? Andy Q writes, "What do you think will be the next big thing for experiencing movies after IMAX 3D?" Um, I think eventually we're going to get virtual reality movies like, you know, when when that happens, you know, whether it be five, ten years from now, I don't know. But I think that once they perfect the technology and they're certainly making a push on it from the Time magazine article to just every time you go to any con, right. like Comic Con or Celebration, they have these displays for the virtual reality. And I think once they, they're starting to perfect the technology, the 360 yeah, technology, yeah, man, there's going to be really those times good. where you're going to just go and the, you're going to get the full movie experience. You almost even have that with the phones. I mean, you could watch a full movie like you're sitting. I did this when I was at Sundance. Mm-hmm. So you, someone had it. You put your phone um, on. You put on Netflix, and it's as if you're sitting in this virtual living room, and you can sign into your Netflix account and bring up the movie, and you could watch the whole movie as if you're in this virtual living room and that that's that's just that's the atari version of it you know and then once you get to the ps4 version of it like meaning today i think it's gonna definitely it'll take a little while for the vr to actually to get it to work right like i think hardcore henry was an interesting attempt at making something that was like an interactive kind of a pov thing but i myself didn't like it because i felt like where's my controller i'm bored watching you know i wanted to take control of it it, and it was draining. Ten minutes of that, like watching it online, is really awesome. But if you put it all together and it doesn't have a good story, it's ninety minutes of action is boring. It's it's impo- it's hard to say that because you're like you'd think, oh my god, I, I was into it the entire time. I got tired and bored because the story there was no story, yeah. was, and, the, and the parts of the story that were there were like the worst video game that you've ever played. So I mean, for me, I'm like I'm really looking forward to like not seeing a, a POV movie again. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that VR movie that you're talking about, where if you are going to be an active participant in the film, they're going to have to give you some decision making right. powers. As a do I go into door one or two? I know it sounds simple, but even that would keep you, uh, you know, stuck in a narrative. padded room, so you're not just bouncing off. Oh the wall. man, that'd be horrifying. <laughs> and I paid money for this. Right. Yes, therapy. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to do any of those. Th- <laughs> I, I, do, I want to go to the movie, pay my nickel, and watch the picture. That's yes. it. That's, that's all I want to do. I'm with all you. Right. Alice. And with that, <laughs> that is our show. So I wanted to thank everybody today on the panel. First, the man going up against the bearded warrior Finstock, Mr. Schnepp. Where can they find you? You guys can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Uh, thank you all for participating in the Kickstarter, Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. I'm going to be pulling it in about an hour, so don't worry about putting any money in. I got a private investor who's going to help me get getting the film made this summer. So Woo-hoo! thanks, That's everybody awesome. who participated. I really appreciate it. Uh, none of your cards are charged because I'm just pulling the project, and I'm going to still make it. It's just going to be done through a, a company. That's awesome. So thank you so much. Congrats. That's really cool to hear. Uh, also, Mr. Mark Ellis, where can they find you? I will be charging your cards for whatever I can before <laughs> it gets pulled. Uh, you can find me at Mark Ellis Live. And like we said before, the Return of the Jedi commentary is going to be up this afternoon at 2 p.m. PST. Look for me crying during a certain Ewok death. And guys, before mm-hmm. I plug my social media over here uh, and Ashley's, I wanted to let you guys know if you're not watching TV talk, make sure you do it. It's every Monday. Josh McCuga leads the latest and greatest in TV news every Monday on this channel. And of course, Collider Jedi Council, which is up Thursday. We've got Ahsoka Tana herself. Uh, Ashley Eckstein's coming on, as well as James Arnold Taylor, who voiced Obi-Wan Kenobi. They will both be on tomorrow's show. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And you can follow me at Twitter at Christian Harloff, Instagram Christian Harloff. And like I mentioned before, please go and watch the Schmodown on Friday and catch us tomorrow on Movie Talk. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.